All right, good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. <laughs> good, good. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I think it's going to be tough for me to be a moderator when I'm just in awe with uh, the people that we have here today. So with no further ado, I'd like to, uh, to welcome you all to Black Perspectives in Public Policy, and it's hosted by the Program in Practical Policy Engagement here at Ford School, obviously. My name is DeAndre Calvert. I'm the Community Engagement Manager for P3E, and uh, we have a great program for you today. So I'd like to introduce our panelists, uh, starting first with Mayor Wimber. Good morning, everyone. My name is Patrick Wimberly, and I have the honor of serving as the mayor for the great city of Inkster. When I say that DeAndre gave me the call, I said I had to answer um, as it relates to this issue. Um, we know that uh, we're living at a time of change, and I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Um, I don't know if you, did you want me to give a little bit more yeah, background? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, well, native son of the city of Inkster, um, for the most part, born and raised in Inkster, lived outside of Inkster probably two, two, uh, two times in my lifetime, uh, for the most part. Um, Love the city of Inkster. Uh, started my career at the Inkster Public School District in uh, 2003, and unfortunately it was closed in 2013 uh, by the state of Michigan, and I went right into um, public activism. Um, during that time, I had a chance to open up a uh, federally qualified health center in the city of Inkster for people that's uninsured and uh, underinsured to be able to, you know, of course, provide quality health care for them and then went off into becoming the mayor pro tem, the, actually the youngest mayor pro tem in the city of uh, Easter. It's kind of like a deputy mayor uh, from 2008 to 2012. And then came back around in 2019 and at the height of COVID became the mayor for the great city of Easter. So been serving and now I'm just looking forward to those next steps and creating a, a better world, not only for the city of Easter, but of course for the state of Michigan. Thank you. I'm Alma Wheeler-Smith. Um, I'm delighted to be here this morning. Uh, and I'm um, a veteran of the Michigan legislature. I worked on Senate staff for um, eight years with Senator Lana Pollock and then was elected to the Michigan Senate um, in my own right and served there for the uh, term limited eligible eight years. Um, after a two-year hiatus and moved on to the Michigan House, served there for six years. Um, all of that time was spent on the Appropriations Committee and on various subcommittees of that larger committee. And um, it's been a wonderful opportunity, of course, to get to know my constituents and the community in which I lived. I was raised here in Ann Arbor, and Ann Arbor was always home. My, when I told my dad I was running for the Michigan Senate, he looked at me and said, I think that's a terrible mistake. He said, everybody has this concept of Washtenaw County as a very liberal bastion. He said, it isn't, and I don't want you to get hurt. Mm. So I said, I think after all of these years with you and mom, I've grown a pretty thick skin, so. Um, Let's, let's take this on. Um, it was a challenge, um, but I had had some pretty good footing in running for the school board and the county commission prior to running for the Michigan legislature. I have uh, two sisters who are also in public service. And so we've batted around a whole lot of conversations about how do you make change, how do you affect people's opportunities. Um, and we do uh, to this day. My older sister is still serving. Um, she is uh, an appeals court judge in Illinois. But I'm looking forward to this discussion and to learning um, and learning from your questions. And if I really do have anything to impart, I hope I can get it out of my mouth and into your ears. <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Theodore Jones, but please call me Ted. Um, I am a project manager with the Office of the Superintendent for Detroit Public Schools Community District. Uh, in that role, I work on uh, board relations, uh, education policy uh, for the district, as well as uh, special assignments. I also work for the Office of Partnerships, uh, helping out with increasing their fundraising capacity for the district. 
So uh, my uh, journey here was a pretty winding one. Um, I actually moved up to uh, Michigan in the third grade. I was uh, born in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, so I'll be rooting for my second, fav second favorite team, <laughs> the Phillies, go birds, <laughs> but always go Lions first. That's it. <laughs> uh, and, you know, uh, we moved to uh, Texas where my dad did his residency um, at, in Dallas and then uh, Arkansas and then finally here. Um, so I uh, attended uh, college in uh, Hampton, uh, Virginia, and after a while came back in 2007 uh, to uh, take classes at the University of Michigan. It, eventually I uh, was accepted into the uh, social work program here in 2008. And from there I was a uh, community organizer and school social worker before working on a uh, state house campaign uh, for Rudy Hobbs. Um, this was back in 2009, 2010. And uh, when he won, he brought me up to work for him in the legislature. So I was the legislative director for two years. I worked in uh, government relations. Um, then I worked on a host of other campaigns and finally started my own firm doing community uh, development as well as uh, political consulting. Uh, but I started working for the district um, through a fellowship program, Detroit Revitalization Fellows. And they placed me with uh, Detroit Public Schools Community District and you know, the rest is history. So I'm uh, really happy in my role and, and uh, to be able to have such a direct involvement in education policy and I Look forward to this lively discussion and uh, being here with all of you. Thank you all so much. So let's let's transition right into um, education, especially in, in the black community. So the cities of Inkster and Detroit have seen major changes to the education system in the last few years. Uh, in addition to COVID, and I, I'm going to target um, Mayor Wimberly and, and Ted first, and then I want to hear from your perspective from the state. But uh, in your roles, uh, how do you ensure that children are supported and educated? Uh, Mayor Wimber? Oh boy. Um, you know, number one, by showing up, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and making sure that not only um, they have a, a choice of education, because in the city of Inkster, unfortunately, um, we have a school of choice type of setup. Um, Would you in, mind in giving uh, some, some context to Inkster school system? Right. So when the city of Inkster was formed in 1964, and believe me, I can get on the whole soapbox as it relates to that, but um, unfortunately, because of segregation, um, you have the north side of Michigan Avenue and you have the south side of Michigan Avenue. And if you lived on the south side of Michigan Avenue, the only school that you had um, to go to during that time or actual district was the Eastern Public School District. Because you were African American, you couldn't necessarily go across Michigan Avenue oh. or, uh, east of, or east of Inkster Road. Um, so the other districts within our 6.2 square miles, which is a city block in the city of Detroit, um, is Westland Public School District. It's always been that way if you lived just um, north of the Inkster Recreation Complex, which is just off of Middle Belt Road, you went to Cherry Hill Performing Arts, and then you went to Westland Public School District. Um, if you lived on the east side of Inkster Road, um, you went to Dearborn Heights mm -hmm. Public School District. But most of those folks were um, Caucasian Americans and the Inkster Public School District was pretty much settled for um, those families that worked for Ford, um, Henry Ford and uh, Mr. Inkster actually formulated the um, first high school in the state of Michigan for African Americans and from there um, homeschooling became into elementary uh, school setups. Uh, Baylor Woodson was, was, was there and also uh, Blanchett Middle School, actually Farrell Middle School, and uh, unfortunately in 2013 the, the state dissolved the Inkster Public School District. Mm -hmm. And now, for the most part, you know, people, you know, think that there's no school district in the city of Inkster mm -hmm. as a whole, but uh, since its inception, it's always had those other entities inside of the district because of segregation. So. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, those kids that live in those areas have to go out and they're bussed out 
um, to go to other districts. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have a great charter school, and I know that when people hear about charter schools, you know, they kind of tense up a little bit, but um, it was actually formulated, the charter school was formulated by a group of teachers that um, had lost their jobs at the Eastern Public School District. Wow. And um, they, it's American International Academy, and they have a really good K through 12 program. So um, for us, just the, the barriers overall, you know, transportation, of course, you know, living in Easter with, um, you know, the economic and social settings that uh, happen in the city that, that cause barriers. So just making sure that, you know, we have safe routes to school, um, transportation, and then, of course, you know, being able to provide any wraparound services through any entities that we can work with to be able to make sure that the kids get everything that they need in order to, you know, have a chance at life. Thank you. I'm going to, uh, to agree with everything you just said because actually my son goes to AIA. He's mm -hmm. in the kindergarten right now. Oh, so okay. he's, he's off Henry Ruff. Yeah. And uh, when, he, when it's time to go to third grade, he'll be at Avondale. Mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Jones? Yes, so um, my daily role uh, is working with uh, board relations and public policy. I mean, um, well, just policy, education policy. So uh, just breaking those down, board relations. So pretty much anything that the uh, Board of Education has to vote on, um, whether it be contracts or uh, new curriculum, uh, et cetera, um, it's generated first by uh, the cabinet member and their departments, and then my role is to actually go through, um, look at the board at the board item, uh, see where there are uh, questions or uh, inconsistencies. Just generally get it ready for superintendent review. Um, then once the superintendent uh, uh, looks at it and gives his feedback on the board item. My role then is to work with the individual uh, departments, divisions, to uh, answer his questions and also um, just make sure that uh, everything is accurate and, and, and ready to uh, go. So uh, basically, uh, when I work with board items, I always ask myself, how does this board item uh, advance the mission of Students First, which is part of Detroit Public Schools Community District's uh, core values. Always student first. So uh, also in my role is uh, uh, pretty much uh, leading the policy process for our district um, is really just making sure where are there gaps within um, the way that we currently operate versus you know what would the ideal be. So uh, when you look at uh, policy, you want to make sure that you're not creating something that is outside of um, you know, the daily operations of our district. Uh, you know, for lack of a better term, creates an unfunded mandate. Um, something that uh, the departments that have to adhere to it just cannot fold into their uh, daily operations. So you know, it's really making sure that um, you're being practical that um, you're also having the, the bottom line of how does this policy um, better the lives of our students, but also um, help our uh, staff have clear guidelines uh, for their daily operations in a way that's uh, least onerous. Now, would you mind providing a little context for uh, the community district versus the, the former district? The sure. Sir, so uh, when the district was and um, I'm going to correct uh, a popular misconception. People actually believe that the district was bailed out in 2017. That actually is not true. So um, the taxpayers will be paying back uh, what the state uh, gave us to uh, create um, our school district to be financially solvent. Um, so DPS is uh, pretty much the um, uh, the debt holder for uh, for for uh, the for the, the money that we got from the district. So, uh, Mich uh, Detroit taxpayers will actually be paying till twenty forty eight, and that's when um, that debt will be uh, released. Um, and then, 
what the dis what the legislature did was they also created a Troy Public Schools Community District. Um, so the community district is actually the one that does the daily operations of uh, teaching uh, our students. Um, and yeah, so you know, basically the. Um, um, let me ask you a question or. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah, yeah. You know, just to let everyone know, kind of the split mm -hmm. that happened um, right. a few years ago, yeah. and I know it was very big for the city, especially. Um, mm -hmm. I was working for the city at the time, mm -hmm. um, and when the Little Caesars Arena was coming, and mm -hmm. you know they were getting money, a brownfield money, and mm -hmm. and everything like that. Um, there was this uproar about mm -hmm. money being taken from the students in the schools. So it just shows how the the students and the education issue in the city really had ramifications not only from the kids but all the way up to development Absolutely. in the city. And just to um, add something, so uh, our property taxes go to, um, uh, to, to fulfill the, the debt, um, that's a 2048. So we do not actually get um, property tax money going towards uh, uh, the community district. That is funded through um, uh, another source uh, through the state government. Thank you. Now, um, Alma, so for those that don't know, the state of Michigan plays a key role in education. Um, from your perspective and your time in the legislature, uh, what statewide policies have hurt and helped uh, black students in Michigan, in your opinion? <laughs> well, um, I think one of the major responsibilities for the state in terms of public education has been funding. Um, and we have worked um, since Prop A in, um, somebody help me with the year, 1980? Prop A, 1994. 94? Prop A, 1994. Yes, just be, yes. See, 19, you see the greatness yeah. here, there, <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. 1994, um, we have been working on a school, a school aid formula that has tried to equalize the amount of money that the state invests per pupil um, it has taken from 1994 to 2020 for us to hit that level where each student was getting the same amount of money from the state of Michigan, which um, is great, but um, at, we need to recognize that there is something more important than equal funding. There needs to be equitable funding. We need to be looking at the conditions of the school districts, the students that come to school, what extra expenses a school district incurs in meeting the needs of low income um, students and their families, the environment in which they live and learn when they're outside of school. So, um, that was a, a conflict in the legislature. Um, the, the term equal funding was, you know, everybody thought that's great. Um, but we allowed school, school districts at the in, institution of Prop um, A to decide if they were going to create their own local millage that would add extra support to their school districts. And, then we limited which school districts could exercise that option. So a certain number of larger, primarily high-income school districts instituted their own millage because they were complaining that they would be losing funding for their students if they didn't have that opportunity. So we continue to have unequal funding in the state of Michigan, even though we have the same state formula dollars going to each student. Um, those kinds of um, mismatches need to be corrected. Um, we need to correct them through an equity funding process. Um, I know that in um, the Ypsilanti School District, not very far from here, we have um, schools with laundry facilities so that kids who come with their one change of clothes for the week um, have an opportunity to get them washed and dried before they go back home if they've been on recess and they get muddy and wet. Um, we have other kinds of, um, the federal lunch program of course helps, but 
three meals a day is critically important to students um, who are low income and who may not have a functioning um, member at home when they get home from school to fix dinner because mom may be working. Um, so those are the kinds of concerns that school districts are faced with that as legislators we are reluctant to acknowledge um, and perhaps don't even understand. We also enjoy a tension between the legislature and the State Board of Education about who's responsible for policy in education and for making curriculum decisions and um, for promoting education policy statewide. So there's always been a, a power struggle um, between the two institutions about that's not your bailiwick. And the legislature, of course, feels that it's empowered to do everything um, and steps on a lot of toes. But um, I, have we gotten there? Yeah. I, I, I just <laughs> want to give her a hug because. <laughs> Thank you. And, and I need that. Man, uh, you know, everything that you just said is basically what happened with the Inkster Public School District. And, you know, and I'm sorry, am I? Go for it. Okay. Go for it. But, um, you know, I just want to, you know, just, just say this, you know, publicly, and, and I say it every chance that I get. I want to thank uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer for her leadership and, of course, you know, the legislators that have supported her to up the funding and, and get it to be, like you said, at least equal. Mm -hmm. But we know that the equitable conversation is, is a pretty tense one mm -hmm. because in the city of Inkster, as we talk about the millage, uh, we're like 72% in millage, in the millage rate, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we couldn't necessarily do what, say, a Canton at 40% at the millage rate could do, you mm -hmm. know, to balance it off. So um, <clears throat> by you saying that, you know, the discussion has to be on equitable services across the board. Um, we have to figure out how to not only awaken the people, but then in turn rally the people to be able to hold our legislators accountable. And I hate that what we talked about a little bit before we came in with the term limits, because you have an understanding, you, you get it. Most kids in the city of Inkster that go to school every day are dealing with um, poverty. Um, they're dealing with, you know, mom, dad, maybe even, you know, a broken home as it relates to mom or dad not being in the home. Um, they're dealing with, you know, just the strain of their ecosystem. Um, in the city of Inkster, we have a large population of low to moderate income housing as it relates to uh, HUD services, and it's like 1,200 units of, uh, they used to call them project housing, mm -hmm. but now they call them, you know, affordable housing. Um, and everyone that's there, or for the most part, they're in this circle, in this rat race, and they're trying to get out. and. Um, me being from Inkster myself, I actually grew up in Denby, um, which is Denby Terrace, and a lot of people know it as um, Little Saigon in, 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 in some circles. Um, you know, it's, it's tough, you know, being able to, you know, get up and go to school every day and, and focus on your work when you're worried about, you know, eating breakfast in the morning or, you know, your, your, your lights may be out, you know. Right. You, you, you may not have the model, the yeah. water may be off, you know. So those things, as we talk about, you know, what, you know, Governor Gretchen Whitmer is doing and she gets it and she's really pushing for that. And I really thank her. I thank her personally every time I see her. I know she probably get, t get tired of me saying it, but um, just having the courage to try to understand and put the conversation on the table for people to become responsible. So I want to definitely continue that conversation with you as it relates to who should we be holding responsible? You know, because people can bat it back and forth all day. Mm -hmm. um, but who's responsible? Like, how can we get change and, 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 and pack change that really will change people's lives? Because it's really about economics at the end of the day. Yeah. And DeAndre, if I can add. Um, so uh, speaking more of the uh, uh, proposal A funding piece, there are also some very glaring omissions. So um, the foundation allowance that comes from Proposition A, that is for general education, 
but there are also um, some uh, funding that needs to be um, uh, done at the state level with regard to uh, school facilities, which um, <laughs> may I add, uh, uh, community, black communities, um, you can see where there's less of a tax base um, that a lot of facilities need just a lot more tender love and care, um, as well as the ELL students, our English language um, learner students, and, and just basically uh, more funding for at-risk students, students mm -hmm. in poverty. So um, when you do not have dedicated funding sources for uh, issues like those, then what happens is you have to use um, general education dollars and then um, education funding, we call that encroachment. We have to use those dollars to pay for, um, for ELL students, for upkeep to um, uh, uh, school facilities. And basically you're, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Mm -hmm. So you actually all have uh, answered the second question, which is great. <laughs> Expand. Oh, go ahead, Ms. Wood. I, I think there's a, a part of your question that we haven't really answered yet, and that's um, how we how we address what the state has done wrong. Mm -hmm. So let's okay. look at the Detroit public school system. Mm -hmm. um, the state took over the Detroit public school system probably for a period of eight to ten years. And in, that cor in the course of that time, um, we didn't watch the process. Um, and you know, we complained about a lot of cheating and a lot of fraud. Um, that was on the state's watch. And the public school system lost millions of dollars that was not going to the education of the students. Um, uh, stories in the Detroit newspapers would talk about trips to you know, the Caribbean for school board meetings, um, uh, limousines and chauffeurs for school board members, uh, money that just sort of disappeared, which became a part of the school district's debt mm -hmm. that citizens are paying, it's a situation similar to Ypsilanti Community Schools. It was a merger there of two school districts that were low income school districts, primarily minority school districts. And they are saddled with millions of dollars of debt. That money is not going to the education of the children. It is going to, um, dollars are being used from the taxpayer rolls to pay off that debt. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying to a school district like Detroit and Ypsilanti community, you've done what we want you to do. You've consolidated school districts. You've um, taken on a new path for the students. Uh, we as a state have the resources and we should be taking care of the debt that is a burden and a detraction from your ability to educate. Mm -hmm. um, these students have tremendous needs. We found that we could make some progress in the legislature when we started talking about not black communities and urban districts that have these problems, but relating them also to rural districts that have the exact same issues mm -hmm. of low funding, mm -hmm low pop property value mm -hmm. um, and the same kinds of needs because the parents are not as educated, not as focused on their, their children's education um, and the opportunities are not the same. I can remember going to the St. John's Public Schools when I was working for Senator Pollack and doing a presentation on um, computer technology in the schools. Mm -hmm. And the superintendent asked me why they should spend money on computers when these kids were just gonna stay here on the farm. Mm -hmm. I was so flabbergasted I couldn't answer the question for a few minutes. And I, I said, well, the reality is your kids are not gonna stay here. They are going to go out and compete for jobs that they will not be ready for because they do not have the basic education in technology. 
it, we need to make sure all kids have an equal chance to get a job mm -hmm. that has value to them. Um, we, we have, at this point in time in our state budget, dollars that we're wondering what to do with, and we're talking about putting in an economic development fund. Uh, let me get on my high horse about spending money on business. You know, the whole business concept in the United States is you get an idea, you find funding from other businesses or other investors, and you build your business. Mm -hmm. It is not the job of the state to put taxpayer money into certain chosen businesses. If we did it across the board and every business got a grant to do some phase of its business, that would be different. But we're picking winners and losers. Wow. Um, and that's not the job of the state. Those dollars need to be invested where our role as a state is critical. And that's in education and health care. And I'll get off my high horse and no, you stay on it. No. Right. I, actually, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask you to get right, uh, right back up there. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, because how can legislation assist in, in access to resources, capital, and opportunities in Black communities? I'm going to start with you. Well, it's recognizing need mm -hmm. um, and opportunity. Uh, when I was in the legislature, I introduced a bill that would do free community college in the state of Michigan because we were seeing kids who had worked hard regardless of what their educational opportunity was in their school district and were ready to go on to school but couldn't even afford the lower tuition rates at community colleges. So mm -hmm. they hit this roadblock and kids that would watch them, you know, working their butts off to get their education saw them just stopped cold um, and said, well, what's the point? <laughs> so we kept saying, look, we can do this easily with the resources we have to do the two years of community college. Mm -hmm. It gives the kids the opportunity to take that associate's degree and get a good job or to move on to a university and complete their education um, and get a better job or go into a profession. Um, we had a great piece of legislation that would get that done. Um, it, I was in the minority in the Senate, and um, I had a couple of people come to me and say, this is a great bill. They had signed on to it, and I said, take it, because a Democrat can't get it passed. And instead of taking mine, the governor developed his own, and the community colleges were saying, this one works, yours doesn't, Governor. Mm. Um, nobody will qualify for money under your bill. Uh, so the intention has to be there to make things work. Um, and you can put out public policy that looks good but is totally inoperable, mm -hmm. um, and if what your game is, is to take credit, then that's the way to work. Mm -hmm. But if you want to get things done that create opportunity and improve lives, you got to do the heavy lifting. Um, Thank you. So. Ted, in your policy journey, what are, you know, what are, how can legislation um, assist in access to, to different resources and, and capital? Yeah, well, um, I think there's, uh, you know, something that be, can be done in the short term, medium term, and long term. So for the short term, I would say that um, the expansion of the Michigan EITC earned income tax credit would really help uh, with the black community. Um, at moment, I believe that the legislation would be, it would be at 30 percent of the federal level. And that would return 163 million to Wayne County, so that would be a, a, a substantial. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would also say uh, affordable housing uh, policy would, would be another area that uh, the state could work on. Um, 
At present, uh, I believe the national average is um, there are about 73% of majority households uh, own their own homes, whereas it's at 43, 44% of black uh, homes, home ownership. So um, in Detroit, those, those figures are actually tracked pretty precisely as well. I think it's 77% um, majority home ownership in Detroit versus uh, 40, yeah, around 43%. Um, of black home ownership as well. And then um, I, I would also say improving public transportation would be something that could help the black community um, as well. Uh, so there was a study a while back um, in 2018 that showed in Detroit uh, about a third of uh, Detroiters lack uh, an automobile. And um, what happened was 40% of those respondents said that um, unreliable public transportation uh, interfered with them either being able to go to an appointment or having to miss work. So those would be three issues, short, medium, long term, that yeah, could really have to make a difference. Thank you. And so as, as a mayor of a city that, uh, so I think it's safe to say the, the founders of Inkster would be kind of mad that you're, uh, you're sitting at the top of the city, huh? <laughs> um, you know, but, you know, with issues of redlining, gerrymandering, and, and transportation, uh, what policies have you fought for or supported to combat these uh, systemic inequalities in the city? Well, in, in the city of Inkster, you know, unfortunately, as, you know, just the council and, and locals can do so much. Mm -hmm. But it really is at the state level and, and the federal level. Um, so we we always, as much as we possibly can, you know, look and see where we can help, and then of course write our legislators, sit down with our legis legislators, let them know exactly what it is that um, we're looking for. Like, for for instance, um, last year um, something happened. In, in the state of Michigan, and I can get off <laughs> real deep off into it, but I want to keep it as simple as possible. Um, redistricting happened mm -hmm. in, 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 in the state. And unfortunately, um, cities like Detroit, um, like Inkster, black and brown cities, we lost representation from people that look like us. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it's been one of those things that, okay, well, how did it even start? What did the conversation start? And then in between, um, who can we work with to make sure that, you know, we have the proper representation? Um, not saying that, you know, everyone has to look like me or even think like me, but at the same time, understand what I'm going through. You know, I have the, have compassion and, and understand that, you know, it's needs that you may have grown up a little bit different, and I think you know both uh, the the people that are sitting on the diocese with me. They they understand and they get it that it's it's tough. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it it is, man. It's it's really tough when you look at you know gerrymandering um, that's been happening, redlining that's been happening um, for for years and years, and systemic racism, unfortunately, has just created this system of injustice that, you know, most people can't get out and they're trapped in. So just being vocal mm -hmm. as much as we possibly can, but also too, not just talking about it, actually figuring out a plan to actually work the plan and, and, and do the work to try to get some things um, across the line, across the finish line. Now, one thing that I can say has happened, uh, and I believe it was last year, um, as it relates to the term limits being extended a little bit, yeah. is, um, as it relates to uh, state state uh, representatives and uh, state senators being able to uh, hold their place a while longer mm -hmm. instead of you know having to basically you know once they're elected they 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 learn in the job and then the next thing you know they're running for office again mm -hmm. and you know now it gives us a little bit more time to actually work and cultivate those relationships to where those people hopefully they can get it you know i would like to create a show where where, where i would uh, take any person that wants to be in the political realm and they have to live first <laughs> in a black and brown community to you know really understand you know what's what, what the needs are 
So, um, you know, just really just for me, again, being, being as vocal as possible, um, working with our state legislators to, to, to try to correct some of the things that have been happening systemically for over 300 years in right. our country. So it's going to be, it's going to be tough, but I think that um, the next generation by having these discussions, especially in places like this, I think that uh, we'll be able to make some great segue. Great. Uh, now, Ted, how have, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to reframe this because you all are having such a great conversation. This piece of paper is almost useless <laughs> at this point, which is a great problem to have. Um, but issues like, you know, redlining, gerrymandering, you mentioned transportation. Um, how much do you see external factors impacting the children within the classroom? Um, you know, maybe hearing from teachers or from a policy pers perspective. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I would say that COVID um, gave a, a very stark, uh, put, it, put the issue in very stark relief. Um, you know, at the very beginning of the pandemic, um, one of the major issues that we had to combat with uh, was now that the schools were no longer open, how do we make sure that our students um, are able to get uh, the meals that they need um, on a daily basis that, that they really do depend on? So what we did was we uh, created a grab, and go, a grab and go program where we um, uh, start off first at, at, at um, all the schools, and then it really started going to a, a hub um, type of approach where uh, district families can just come, um, they can pick up meals uh, for not just their student, but, but for all the children um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the household, and they can uh, pick up you know, several days' worth uh, of meals. So you know, one would just be in, food insecurity. Um, is something that we have to deal with. Um, I, I, would, I would say also uh, another thing that we have to deal with, uh, not just in Detroit Public Schools Community District, but um, for uh, black communities in general, is a lack of, um, of, lack of access to um, advanced uh, placement um, programming. So, you know, I, I believe that um, that the last, I believe it was in 2019, um, 2020, that there was about 77%, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, about 110,000 uh, students who took the AP test. 77% um, of them were uh, uh, majority students. 4%, uh, just over 4% were black students, and just over 6% were um, Hispanic students. So. There are um, still um, uh, niggling uh, disparities within the education system that we have to deal with just on um, education programming itself. Yeah. Uh, Doctor, too, if I can just add to that, you know, during COVID, technology mm -hmm. and, and having access to the internet was a, a, a big thing for, um, you know, black and brown communities because of the disparities in, as it relates to economic, you know, economics within the community. So, you know, even with that now um, being one of the major issues as it, as it changed the way all of us um, do business and we, we interact with each other as it relates to um, the internet. So, like, we would have had this on Zoom last year possibly, <laughs> right? But most of our kids in the Eastern Public Schools in that whole area, and I call it Eastern Public still because it is what it is, but um, they had major challenges getting on the internet because they couldn't afford it. They couldn't afford the high-speed internet that was required. So um, seeing the state government actually putting, um, and the federal government actually putting some monies towards that, I think it's gonna really help um, close that gap as it relates to the digital divide for black, brown communities and rural communities also. Absolutely. So Alma, you said, uh, you mentioned that there was a bill that you had to pass off because you didn't think that, you know, you'd be able to uh, get the support from it. But what are some of the bills that you were able to pass or able to support in the legislature that combated some systemic issues? Well, um, I, I don't know. I always went for the esoteric crazy stuff. Um, like universal health care. <laughs> uh, 
So um, I started, I introduced legislation to um, eliminate lead poisoning in the housing. Um, and that one was taken and passed by my majority <laughs> team, which was great. Mm -hmm. um, I was happy to hand off. Um, we did, I did a lot of work, uh, because I was on the Appropriations Committee, we did um, a lot of policy through amendments to other bills because you weren't on those committees where you had deep involvement in structuring them. So um, I did a lot of amendment work on some policy pieces, but in appropriations, I was able to do quite a bit of funding direction um, toward environmental justice issues, um, toward health care mm -hmm. um, and education. So, you know, if I could, uh, I passed a lot of pieces of legislation, but I didn't look back after all these years to see <laughs> what they were. Um, but with, with appropriations, they are one-year bills, um, but you have an opportunity to, rec to direct spending. Mm -hmm. And that is such a key um, portion of the power of the legislature. Um, for um, folks who may not be aware, the Congress has returned to earmarking. Mm -hmm. Um, and building a relationship with your legislator, your congressperson, is critically important to getting your hands on dollars for um, nonprofits and government projects in your communities. I was very concerned and headed the corrections subcommittee of um, the Appropriations Committee, both in the House and Senate, while well, I was vice chair in the Senate. Um, but I worked with probably the most conservative senator in the legislature, um, who was the chair of the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee on Corrections when I was in the House, to create a reentry program. Incarceration and um, the sort of school to prison pipeline mm -hmm. is of critical interest to the black community. While we, are, we don't think monolithically, we certainly have issues that we want addressed. We may have different ways to get there. And I found in working with um, my Republican counterpart in the Senate um, on corrections issues, he was ultra conservative, and here I am, a radical liberal. But we wanted some of the same goals. And you just had to create a language that could get you there. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a matter of listening and understanding where he was coming from that built that line of communication where we could create a reentry program so that people who were released had an opportunity for housing, work, um, and not going back. Um, that's one of the major problems with our correction system. We spend billions of dollars each year um, trying to help people get on a different path, but we do nothing to help them put their foot on the path when they're outside of the prison system. Right. Mm -hmm. So a reentry program was established, and I take a lot of credit for that. Um, working with Alan Croxy, I think um, a, we did a decent job. Um, the and and that's one of the major issues for black communities mm -hmm. too is um, over policing of some of the communities, um, finding uh, children being criminalized in school for what used to be just bad kid behavior. <laughs> Um, the IEP. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, we, the black community is intensely interested. We, there was a poll done of black voters um, at the end of the, just before the midterm um, elections last year. And 
it showed that yes, we were concerned about economic issues, we were concerned about inflation and high prices, um, but we were equally concerned about social issues of health care. Um, COVID would have been far worse for our community if we had not had the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. and insurance, but it was still horrible because of systemic things like gerrymandering, the inability for black families to gain wealth mm -hmm. um, and create greater opportunities for their kids um, and pass that on. So I'm kind of meandering, so I'm going to stop talking. No, so this is this is a, a, a great way to end with our, our formal questions. Um, you know, in, in the black community, uh, we're familiar with the Oprah quote from uh, from Color Purple: "All my life, I had to fight." You know, we, we, we know that, and that's something that we can joke about, but it's real. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, this, this one thing that is great about this conversation uh, and, and seeing you all just riff off each other. Not only is it fantastic from a policy perspective and a professional perspective, but we can get in that barbershop talk and that, you know, those those talks that are that are real and unapologetically black. So from from that perspective, from you know, from policy and community, how do we keep fighting in a country uh, that was built by us but that wasn't built for us, uh, in, in your opinion? And I start with Yeah, you. I, again I would just go back to continue to having these conversations mm -hmm. and, and, and really holding people accountable. In, in their positions. Um, as the mayor for the, the great city of Inkster, and, and I love the city of Inkster, um, you know, I tell my people all the time, listen, hold me accountable. Make sure that I'm responsible, you know, for the position that you put me in. And we have to do the same thing for, you know, just conversations and our, with our legislators. Mm -hmm. You know, holding them accountable, you know, and saying to them what our needs are. You know, I don't think most of the folks even know about the statistics that you just, you know, gave off as it relates to, you know, legislators is there now, you know, unfortunately. But, you know, truly putting it right in their face, not only fighting, but educating people right. and giving them an opportunity to hopefully shine ultimately. Yeah, and which is something we, we were discussing before this. It's it's tough, especially if you are, you know, the only black face in a white space mm -hmm. or, you know, they say the squeaky wheel gets the oil. But if you're the only one that looks like, you know, looks like you and representing your communities, how do you do that in a manner that just doesn't get drowned out or that isn't just kind of pacified? Um, you know, so it, it raises so many questions, but you, you're you're completely right. You have to keep on you have to keep on pushing. You have to, you have to, you, you know, again, and, and understand this, I mean, you know, America wouldn't be the place that it is today if we didn't have help from our brothers and sisters uh, that don't necessarily look like us. Mm -hmm. It's people that, you know, again, that want to do the right thing. Right. That's a human thing. So really finding those people and then making as much noise as you can together. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think that's ultimately what it is. Keep talking. And the wonderful thing about social media, and I know we can talk about all the negatives with social media, is that everyone has a platform. And if we continue to talk about the issues, make sure that the issues have um, an actual charge with the issue. Not just, you know, this is my issue, but how do we solve it? Mm -hmm. How do we work on becoming better human beings, ultimately. I think that's, that's what we should be doing. That's a great start. Okay. Alma? Well, I think I learned that you keep on keeping on. Mm -hmm. um, you, it's a persistence and a resilience. My mm -hmm. um, dad was the first black faculty member at the University of Michigan. Um, wow. He remained an assistant professor until a few years before his retirement because he kept rocking the boat mm -hmm. at the university and in the community and in the state. He was engaged in civil rights work and so was my mom and they were out there pushing this liberal community to bring black folks onto those public schools teaching staff. There wasn't one when I was growing up to make sure that if you went into a restaurant, the table that you were assigned wasn't near the bathroom or the entrance exit door to the, rest, the food area. Um, to make sure that kids 
saw administrators in the school that looked like us mm -hmm. to make sure that we had opportunities for housing wherever in the city we wanted to live. Um, that the black areas of the city were not the only place a black family could have a house. Um, that was supported by real estate agreements with the realtors and by the banks not lending. I think everybody's pretty aware of that. Um, but it's that constant move forward um, and being patient with a step at a time. I am not a patient person. Um, <laughs> but you've got to understand that it isn't going to happen your way. You've got to bring a whole lot of people along with you who are resistant, who aren't understanding, who may in their hearts want to believe, <laughs> but um, it's not their experience. So they, they have trouble understanding that you're not making excuses. You're explaining what life has been like and what that means over a continuum of years. Um, so Persistence, um, finding people who will work with you. Um, my parents couldn't have made change in Ann Arbor if they hadn't had a whole lot of white folks um, understanding the issues mm -hmm. and working with them to create a housing ordinance, um, to, to break down the barriers in education, to um, create opportunities for their kids and others. Um, so we keep on keeping on. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I have little to add. So I, I, I agree with both my uh, fellow panel members here. We, we need to be persistent. We have to have relentless conversations about um, the effect still of racial discrimination and uh, a discriminatory policy on the black community. I, I would say also, I, I think, for instance, with regard to criminal justice um, and, and policing reform, um, you know, I, I think it was the advent of uh, the cell phone camera that really <laughs> brought uh, into stark relief uh, what was going on in the black community with regard to um, police encounters and, and um, uh, 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 unarmed uh, black people uh, being disproportionately um, exposed to police brutality. So I, I wonder what are the next things that we can uh, bring that type of spotlight to uh, within uh, the black community to, to really you know, open people's eyes up and, and make sure that uh, we can attack uh, issues such as uh, the need for affordable housing, uh, the need uh, for you know equitable funding uh, in education, and, and other uh, issues with regard to access to resources. Thank you so much. So now we're going to open it up to questions from our audience. Uh, we did have one that was a part of the uh, RSVP. So while everyone's thinking of their questions, I will pose this to anyone that'd like to answer. But do you think effective change comes from federal policy or local policy? I think it. I think it comes from all. Uh, comes from three levels: mm -hmm. the local level, cities, townships, um, where people think creatively about how to resolve a problem. Mm -hmm. And if they haven't been limited in their opportunity to solve that problem by a state legislature, um, they're able to create a pilot program that may work very well for them and be replicable in other communities. Um, we also have an opportunity at the state level for that same kind of um, thought and policy development. The federal government has its role. I think there are places where universal opportunity um, is important. Um, and that's where federal policy plays a very important role. Transportation is a great example. You know, the federal highways that allow us all to move across the country. But it's in states where a transportation department can say, 
we've got electric vehicles. Can we actually use our freeways to create energy to power those vehicles um, so that we don't have to have 100,000 charging stations? They're charged as they're driving. Um, but the dollars that can be spent on some of our very heavy lifting pro projects um, have to come from those that have the dollars, and right. that is often, most often, the federal government. Um, we've got some real infrastructure problems that, you know, the new infrastructure bill that was passed last year um, can certainly help with, mm -hmm. but when you talk about the billions of dollars it's going to cost to put a new water system in for Flint mm -hmm. and Benton Harbor. Um, that's not something the states can take on uh, on their own, and it certainly isn't something that Inkster can afford. Mm -hmm. um, so we each have our role, and sometimes it's the little guy that pushes the state, mm -hmm. and um, that's when the legislature sometimes gets its nose out of joint and passes a law that says local units of government cannot do A, B, and C, you know. Um, but we all have a role, and we learn from some of the programs that are started at the very smallest local level. Thank you for that. Okay, do we have any questions? <coughs> Excuse me. We have um, a microphone we can hand off to you. We're starting over here, and then see you all. Livia. And if, if you all like to introduce yourself, your name, um, your your program, and your policy interests, that would be great. Yeah. Hi, my name is Tania Harris. I'm a second year MPP student, and my policy concentration is uh, mostly social policy. Um, Dr. Jones, I also went to college in Hampton, Virginia, oh. so I'm wondering if you're a pirate as well. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And me too. Oh, good. <laughs> um, but my question is along the education basis. I was just wondering if you guys can talk about how much you've interacted with um, or like the current debate on whether or not critical race theory should be included in what we're teaching in schools or not, and like how you create policy that combats that. Well, I, I will um, actually point to Detroit Public Schools Community District. I believe it was in 2018 that we put out a resolution stating that we were an anti-racist uh, district. So it is things like that uh, that school districts can do um, that you know start at the board, uh, the board of education level. And uh, the way that that work kind of redounds um, to you know, all aspects of what we do is we're very intentional in our curriculum about um, uh, you know, showing African-American history, showing, um, uh, you know, really putting it into our, our daily curriculum and, and how we teach history. So I, I would say that would be the most, you know, glaring example. Thank you. Olivia? Great. Um, hi, my name is Olivia Baden. I am a second year MPP student here at the Ford School. <clears throat> um, my focus is on economic mobility and workforce development. And my question um, has less to do with policy and more to do with just, um, I guess, your careers. And you talked about, like, the persistence and having these conversations even maybe when you are the only voice in the room and as someone that's about to re-enter the workforce after being here in somewhat of a bubble, um, how do you, with that persistence and with the care that I can tell that you all have for your communities, how do you take care of yourself as black public servants? Because that's something that, you know, we don't have a class wow. here at the Ford School about like taking care of yourself in public service and, and that's something that I think a lot of us are running into right now, the burnout of it all. Well, I'll, I'll try to answer that one. When you're passionate about something, I mean, you know, it's just that human nature in you to always want to go and always want to work. And I think that was one of the things earlier on for me as I became the mayor of the great city of Inkster. You know, it was like I was burning the candle with both ends. And really 
not getting things done in, in the whole, you know. Um, I was doing a lot of things, but I had to refocus myself and, you know, say, okay, these are my priorities. And when you start to work on your priorities and then you bring along help from the people that's, you know, passionate like you. And, of course, in my position, I'm, you know, the CEO of the organization. <clears throat> you know, I hired the, the people to actually assist me and help me carry that load. But to to take care of yourself is if if you're not if you're not good nobody else is good you know especially in my position as the mayor of the city of Inkster you know um, it's for me it's the grassroots approach but at the same time knowing that you know family first well God for me first um, family and then you know community is all part of that and when I look at the community it is family so um, for me in my position that's pretty much how to you know I go about it for the most part, but I'm always, somebody's always telling me, stop, Mary, you're doing too much still, <laughs> you know, but, you know, when you have passion, it's just what it is. My knee-jerk answer would have been, I don't take care of myself. <laughs> um, but the hardest thing I had to learn was to say no, um, because mm -hmm. you can spread yourself like peanut butter and um, then you become ineffective mm -hmm. because you are exhausted. Um, I've found that uh, being around people who have a good sense of humor is worth more than sleep. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've tried to find people who care a lot about policy but can also sit there and laugh at the crazy things you've gone through mm -hmm. to make a little tiny bit of progress, you know, <laughs> because it is humorous if you, uh, otherwise you'd cry, <laughs> um, spend your life crying. <laughs> so um, it's, uh, family is important because I've got family members who are involved in um, public service, but who see the humor every day of what they do um, before she became a judge, my sister worked in a model city's legal service, and I mean, they would have people come in off the street who were just out of their minds and uh, want them to solve all kinds of problems through the legal system, and the problems were definitely not going to court. So. Um, I always told her she should write a book. Uh, her secretary had a phrase, what makes them go out to lunch and never come home? <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, but you have to find the humor in your life because it is the thing I think that will sustain you. Um. <laughs> well, one tangible thing I did was I bought a Peloton. So, uh, <laughs> yep. So I, I, I oh, you a, sound like my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a big proponent of um, you know uh, working out, and I, I'm uh, for the last month or so I've been trying to eat healthier. So um, you know, taking care of uh, my body, but also um, really making sure that um, you know not taking on too much, too many things. So knowing when to say no uh, to new projects. And of course, you know, family uh, time. And uh, I also have a girlfriend who has a, a two-year-old son. So having some time with them as well, um, just, yeah, uh, really helps with uh, uh, guarding against burnout. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, over here first. Hi, um, thanks for being here. Um, I'm Haley, I'm a dual uh, degree in the policy school and the business school. Um, and I came in late after work, so if you already covered this, skip my question, but um, when I was an undergrad at Michigan, the black popul student population was 6%, and 10 years later, it's now 4%. And we talk about the increase in scholarship availability for students in Detroit and for black students coming to Michigan, but clearly that doesn't address so many of the systemic problems that are you know, um, causing this discrepancy. So I was just wondering if you guys could speak to you know, what might be going on here and, and how can we as students better hold the university accountable? The cold, no, I'm just, uh, <laughs> I said the cold. <laughs> right, yeah, the, the weather, yeah, for sure. sure. It's a great question. Um, I, 
affordability is an issue. Um, the university over the past seven years has worked to create scholarship opportunities in Detroit, in Ypsilanti, um, but those opportunities importantly begin with young students. So it's gonna take a while before you see the students in those paths arrive at the institution. Um, but having affordability, um, I, I don't know if you were here when I talked about my legislation to create free tuition for community colleges. We, in working through that bill, we were talking with the Senate Fiscal Agency and one of the um, economists said, you know, it's just a few million dollars more to do the full ride for a four-year institution because the federal government picks up most of the money through Pell Grants and um, their other sort of universally applicable um, fellowships and scholarships. So um, the state would have been paying approximately 25% of the cost of tuition here at the University of Michigan for four years for students. Um, I think being bold in our public policy that makes opportunity universally available is um, something that is achievable and desirable. I had a lot of people say, well, the kids won't work hard, they won't learn if it's given to them. Um, and maybe for some that would be true. Um, you don't always value what's free, but I think it's the way we teach people about how critical education is to their own development that makes it important, um, not how much it costs. Um, and not the job you might get afterwards, but the value of learning and the creativity it generates in you to solve problems and help other folks. Um, so I'm a big proponent of free education all the way through. Um, I, um, I remember Morris Hood when he was in the legislature um, Said to, the to, said to the University of Michigan, if your student population doesn't look like the population in the state of Michigan, I will cut your funding. For a long time that meant something to the university because the state share of funding to the institution was significant. It is no longer significant to the University of Michigan. So that threat is an empty, um, threat, and it, the desire for diversity has to come from the institution itself. I think it's there. Um, I think we just have to be more creative about how we give kids the belief that if they work hard in school, that opportunity to go to a university is available, not just a hope. I think I'd, I'd like to mention um, We'd be remiss if we didn't think kind of socially also and think about imposter syndrome. You know, the University of Michigan, you know, the, there's so much prestige from athletics to academics, and there may be people from, you know, from different communities. Like, I can't go there. Like, I'm not smart yes, enough to go here. I, I've worked here for five years, and I've, I still feel that, you know, working here, um, shoot, I, I spoke to some students a couple weeks ago, and I emailed my colleague, and I'm like, did I do a good job? Like, I feel like I, I wasn't <laughs> polished enough, even though I've been doing this for how long? I, I'm cool enough to get the mayor of Inkster to text me, you know. Uh, so, but that's you know from a from a student perspective, I think maybe the university can can kind of open that, and students can open that too to let people know that you know whatever you're looking for here, you can find, and there is a space for you, and you know there are opportunities to uh, to get you in the space too because you deserve to be here, you know, just as much as anyone else. So, no, actually, if I could yeah. add to that also, <laughs> so um, with. Uh, affirmative action uh, being disallowed. Uh, I, I, I would also uh, say, you know, universities should um, explore a more economically based model for um, for uh, for affirmative action, not based on race, but on um, the 
on income of, of a family as well. And you know, that will uh, capture more um, minority students, but also just students in general who, whose families might be um, unable to, to afford a uh, University of Michigan education. That's, that's a great model. And, and if I could just add to that more on the social side of it, um, you know, and I really appreciate what you said because it's part of that, mm -hmm. but it's also too that, you know, in most black and brown communities, about 50% of the kids read at a ninth grade level when they graduate from high school. So, you know, being prepared and making sure that, again, we have those wrap around services because you know again you don't know what the situation may be at home mm -hmm. so when a kid gets to school and you know that may be their only meal that they've had and and understanding two mental health issues across the board and and, and understanding that talking to a therapist is you know is out of reach for a lot of african americans to be able to you know actually you know if they're going through something at home you know not being able to talk to uh, someone, you know, so when we talk about, you know, the economic barriers, mm -hmm. mental health barriers, um, you know, the wraparound services yeah. to make sure that, you know, the kids are being tutored properly, you know, and being and, and, and getting that curriculum right in their face mm -hmm. in the ninth grade. You know, um, <clears throat> the one thing that I loved about the Eastern Public School District is that we had a dual enrollment program where the kids went to college in the day and, and at the same time they went to high school and they were exposed to to that you know but you know of course that that went away and it's in the westland public school district and it's great and the dearborn heights public school district is great but however what happens when they leave school and they just they just don't feel prepared you know um they, they're not ready mm -hmm. for the university of michigan you know we, you know, excellence is achievable if you have the tools mm -hmm. to be able to apply yourself. So I think that's the biggest part of it. Absolutely. I think, uh, I think my, my clock is ticking. We have one more. How, how many more questions do we have? Just. I can also oh, like, wait okay. until after. No, no, no. Um, oh, if you're the last one, then we can end on that. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for such a refreshing event. Um, my name is Sam Owusu. I am a staff member here. I work at one of the research centers, the Education Policy Initiative. We sort of leverage administrative data um, and mixed method approaches to do uh, research for social progress, primarily in Michigan. Um, a lot of our studies are based in Michigan, so a lot of contact with the Detroit Public School Community District. Uh, my question is sort of, uh, and I also wanted to mention, I'm so glad someone mentioned the issue of term limits, it makes my life as a researcher hectic because there's a new administrative <laughs> priority and new, new people to talk to all the time, right? Um, but my question sort of relates to the idea of relationship building for policymaking. Um, I guess, how do you all approach building and maintaining strong relationships with policymakers, advocacy networks, even the research community? I mean, we can think about this as like, uh, you know, it's not only a triangle between bureaucrats uh, policymakers and advocacy orgs. It's also sort of like a square where the research organizations are involved, community activists are involved. So how do you manage sort of building those connections and maintaining those connections to build effective policy, particularly for marginalized groups? What was the big joke uh, with Clinton? Something about the Clinton Rolodex <laughs> that he started when he was age seven. <laughs> I think I think we all do that as as policymakers. You start with your friends in high school, and you say, "Well, that person went to you know some institution and studied public policy, and their area of expertise was environmental justice." Uh, I'm calling them. If they don't know the answer, maybe they know someone who knows the answer or has a public policy interest or they'll know someone. So it's starting with a tree. Um, when you were in elementary school, there was the phone tree for the bus. When you're in public policy, there's the phone tree for an issue. Hmm. You call the agency that works on that issue and you say, I need so-and-so to give me advice on this particular um, component of the issue I'm working on. Um, it's, and then because you've 
stolen their ideas, if you will, and put them in the legislation that you're drafting, you stay in touch to let them know what's happened. But it's looking beyond the specific issue area to things that are tangential to it. Mm. Um, I worked on um, ending corporal punishment in the public schools here in Michigan when I was working for Lana Pollock. Um, she was the senator that preceded me. And, you know, we were talking originally to educators. And then we said, well, wait a minute. There are other people who are concerned about this. We need to contact parent-teacher organizations. We need to contact mental health workers. We need to be in touch with um, people who do after-school care, who can bring different perspectives to bear on this public policy issue that most people wouldn't think they even thought about. Um, but they have a lot to contribute, and they have a lot of context. They know other legislators that they can talk to and build that support for the policy um, through their network. So the more networks you can get engaged on a public policy issue, the